Is there any person in the world who wants to have nuclear weapons, who thinks it's a good idea to go and blow other people out of existence? I mean, it's madness. On uh, nuclear weapons, Pope Francis, uh, at a conference which I attended in the Vatican in November of 2017, uh, came out with an historic statement in which he categorically rejected nuclear weapons and said uh, that their very possession uh, is to be firmly condemned. And while popes through the last several decades have all uh, uh, come out for the abolition of nuclear weapons, this was the first time that the Holy See, uh, at the level of the Pope, has condemned the very possession of nuclear weapons. This is a very important step and has aided the United Nations in moving forward on its new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. This treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons was adopted on July the 7th, 2017, when 122 states voted in favor of it. And the Holy See uh, was uh, among the first to sign the treaty and to ratify it. So the Holy See has uh, given a tremendous leadership in identifying and trying to do something about this immense problem that faces humanity. It's now incumbent on uh, the Canadian bishops uh, to follow up on what Pope Francis has said in a very formal manner. Has Canada not signed this treaty? Canada has not signed the treaty. Canada has rejected so far any consideration of signing the treaty because the United States is opposed to it. Uh, all the major states that have nuclear weapons, the United States, Russia, Britain, France and China, have opposed this new treaty on the grounds that it stigmatizes the possession of nuclear weapons. And that is, of course, exactly what it does. It, it renders them both immoral as well as illegal. And those states do not want to have their stocks of nuclear weapons, and there are 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world today, possessed pr principally by these major states. They do not want to have them condemned. And so the United States issued a stern warning to all its NATO partners not to be involved in this new treaty. So this is a, uh, this is, this is a separate problem all by itself, H how to deal with uh, the opposition to a treaty that is trying to advance the safety and security of all of, all of humanity. Is there any person in the world who wants to have nuclear weapons, who thinks it's a good idea to go and blow other people out of existence? I mean, it's madness. So we've got to get beyond this. And so that's why I'm so grateful to uh, Pope Francis for his leadership in this. And I expect, I expect that the Canadian bishops will follow up on what Pope Francis has said. So we need to delineate and pronounce and act more on concrete advances for the human condition for peace. Mm -hmm. That would be a policy, a foreign policy worthy of Canada. And I believe that the Canadian bishops uh, should be encouraging, should be strengthening, should be pushing the government, not in a partisan way, the bishops are not involved in partisan politics, but the bishops are certainly involved in the advancement of social justice. And you advance social justice through public policies, right. as well as charitable responses. And this is where I think we can find some really great inspiration in the uh, social teaching of the church, going back for a long period of time, more well, well more than uh, over a hundred years, uh, to uh, and culminating in the Second Vatican Council, and particularly the, the document on the church in the modern world. That's what's inspired me in my life um, all all these years. The the social teaching of the church and uh, the, the uh, manner in which the Second Vatican Council expressed uh, who we are in the church and what the church is in the world. And that's what I want to hear from the bishops today. Moving on to the global stage, North and South Korea are meeting today for the first time in years. 
the two Koreas are t uh, talking while President Trump and leader Kim are in a war of words. They've been very hostile to each other. What's your assessment of this? I believe that there's only one solution to the what's called the North Korea problem, and that is negotiations. Um, North Korea says uh, that it uh, possesses uh, nuclear weapons, and the United States has taken a position that it has to uh, get rid of its nuclear weapons before it will talk. But this is a ridiculous position. And here is the United States holding, you know, half of, uh, uh, almost half of all the nuclear weapons that ever already exist in the world. We cannot have, what North, Korea, what North Korea does is expose the real problem here. Now, do not misunderstand me. The acquisition of nuclear weapons by North Korea is a big problem. But a much bigger problem is the holding of nuclear weapons by all those states who p currently possess them. There are nine states that have nuclear weapons, 15,000 in total. By what right, do they, what right do they have to maintain their nuclear weapons while proscribing their acquisition by any other country? And so we say, well, we don't want the proliferation of nuclear weapons. We must stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Stop North Korea. Yes. But how do you stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons if some states arrogate unto themselves the right to continue to possess them? And so that's the bigger problem. This is what the Prohibition Treaty signed at the United Nations July the 7th, 2017, gets at. It, it, uh, it outlaws, it stigmatizes the possession of nuclear weapons. So while we are trying to resolve the North Korea crisis, uh, on the one hand, we ought to be looking at a much broader uh, perspective on the other. What role does the church have between these two leaders? Well, um, in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, with John F. Kennedy of the United States and Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union, uh, Pope uh, uh, John XXIII uh, stepped up and wrote to both leaders in the name of humanity to come down from the nuclear mountain that they were climbing. And uh, Pravda was, was so impressed with it, they printed Pope's message on page one. And so uh, the role of the church um, in providing back-channel diplomacy in, in, the, in the way in which Gorbachev was received at the Vatican long before the end of the Cold War and the way in which uh, uh, popes have led in economic and social development issues and in the building of peace uh, has, uh, been, uh, has been uh, at times instrumental. When Pope Francis comes out uh, explicitly condemning the possession of nuclear weapons, then I think it's the uh, responsibility of all the rest of us in the church uh, to hear that and not just to have the Pope make a speech and put it on the library shelf, but to enact it. So this is a time for me of great decision making and great action needed in the church today. You wrote a book called Peacemakers in which you talked to world leaders about world free of war. Is this realistic? In the 20th century, we had 100 million people killed in wars. World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, several other wars. 100 million people killed. Today, we have wars, and I lament every single death in any war today, but the numbers are nowhere near Not even close. what we had before. Nowhere near. Five-sixths of the world is living at peace. So let's try to put it all in perspective uh, for reasons for hope that we can build on what we have already achieved um, and not uh, let the military industrial complex, you talked about arms trade and all this before. I mean, there are people who are making enormous sums of money off of arms and, and it's to their benefit to keep everything agitated and on edge. We cannot allow the disorder in the world to become the norm. Rather, it's the norm should be order. And, and we tried to, we, this, this spirit 
was quite evident after the end of World War II, in, in, the early, in the late 40s and the early 50s, when the Marshall Plan for, it was, it came into existence, in which the United States helped Europe to recover. I mean, a, a building up of people rather than, rather than uh, living on the edge and being frightened. So I would say what, what the one thing we are now facing in the, as we come well now into the, uh, the end of the second decade of the 21st century is the great debate in, in humanity. Are we going to be an open or a closed society? That, that's the debate. Are we going to be inclusive or exclusive? I mean, are we going to welcome opportunities to help people to grow and develop? Or are we going to build walls and to shut them out? You know, and, 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 you know bridges or walls? How are we going to face a changing humanity with all its problems of automation and technology and artificial intelligence and all these things that are coming down the line, eh? Are we going to hide in, our, in my shell and going to put a cloak over my head and, for, you know, go away, don't bother me? Or are we going to recognize the world as it is and open our arms to one another? Mm -hmm. And so it's our attitude to one another in the world today in which everybody is our neighbor. My neighbor is not just the person who lives in the apartment beside me. My neighbor is the woman in Bangladesh, the farmer in India. We have to understand the oneness of humanity, that we are all one under God.